fundraising. Sorry, uh, it involves a lot of fundraising. And as we all know, our local chapters are the backbone of HSDA. And we're hoping that a lot of you guys are able to kind of help us in our efforts to fundraise for Summit this year. Um, and so this is just a table of contents and uh, we're just gonna go over, you know, how to plan for a fundraising initiative, you know, potential ideas for fundraising initiatives, um, Act Blue, which is the platform that HSDA is legally allowed to use for fundraising. And then finally, we're going to end on um, ways that you can boost local chapter engagement and really just engage your membership in these initiatives. Um, but just to kind of get us started, we have a guest speaker today who I will now pass it off to him and let him introduce himself. Sure, thanks so much for having me. Um, and I did have a chance to look at that PowerPoint briefly before uh, joining. So I, I will try to skip over anything that I was going to say that was in that. Um, and I appreciate this kind introduction. It, it kind of does me justice, but I will say we had a $4 million program uh, for the Senator and uh, it was a good one. Would love to invite everyone to turn on your cameras if you're if you're here and I know it's a small group, so I'm happy to take questions throughout and, um, you know, please feel free to send a message and I'll leave some time at the end for that as well. Um, but yeah, I guess I'd start by way of background for myself on the fundraising and I think just discuss some of the pathways and I think fundraising is one of the most difficult and important aspects. So um, I started interning when I was 17 for one of the largest fundraising, fundraising consultants out here and ended up working for her. Um, for a number of years, uh, worked on races, you know, uh, Ricardo Lars for a Senate race, as well as dozens of council races, uh, went back to school and got my master's. Um, and I think, you know, I say by way of background, because I know a lot of you are trying to get your foot in the door, figure out how to raise money for local chapters. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's different levels to fundraising, of course, and uh, I will briefly discuss at high level and, and try to tie that in. But I never thought this would be the pathway for me. Uh, I was going the academic route, and I know many of you are probably considering academics or, um, of course, your bachelor's, but uh, further in degrees uh, to get your master's or PhDs. And that was kind of where I was going when Trump got elected. And I think for me, seeing firsthand the, the sadness or, I guess, disparity in the eyes of my professors was what I saw as a, as a jump back in progress. And I know. Uh, we are in dire straits now, but a decade ago, uh, many of us thought that the world was turning around and things were going to get better slowly, but we were hopeful. And of course, the last four years have shown us that your activism is more important than ever. Um, I think uh, fundraising, fundraising has been shown to be more important than ever as well. Of course, coalition building has played a big role in, in the success of the last few years and shifting things. But um, unfortunately, given Citizens United, the importance of money in politics, or the fact that we don't often pay most of our local elected officials uh, much, and again, I know all of you from different places in the country, but here in California, we don't really pay our council members and creates a barrier to entry and, and creates an importance for money. Um, but I think what, what drove me back to this is it's better to have those resources in the hands of, of good candidates or passes along, pass information to folks like you. Um, so I ended up working for two of the largest races out here in Orange County in the last two cycles. Uh, and I think one of the one of the important things I will I will highlight is because the PowerPoint is so robust and it looks like you all have a, have a team of folks creating these things and giving you all the different uh, paradigms and and fun ways to raise money. I think it, it's it's a lot of hard work. And I'll bring it back to Senator Min. Uh, and I don't know if many of you know much about him. Um, I won't. I think one of the reasons I came back is to be able to help people like him who embody what we need in office. And he spent a majority of his career in public service. Um, but more importantly, he's willing to put himself out there, right? He's willing to take the hard stances and uh, take the hard questions. And you know, as much as we can support a candidate, it is up to them to be successful and put in the work. And, and you're the ones who are putting the work in this organization. So you're taking the first step by being here and, and starting the coalition. Um, I, briefly, a few of the initiatives I ran, and one of the ones I think could be important for you all is, is always brought in your expansions and co list cultivation and expansion. I think for 
folks like you who are, uh, you have an organization that has a specific mission, right? And whether that's, you know, I, I'd say to me from the outside looking in, I, I look at it as getting the next generation involved. And that, that's the biggest selling point, right? For older folks. Uh, and for Senator Men, it would be, he's a lawyer, he's an educator, he's a parent, right? He's one of the first, or one of two API senators, the first Asian Democrat out of Orange County uh, above the municipal level in history. Um, and it's about turning over each of those rocks. All, all of these different aspects of their, of their lives are different ways to raise money. And, and I'm, I'm seeing more that we're tailoring this to the org, to high school Democrats. So um, I'd say that whether or not you're looking locally or nationally or, or statewide, the, the hook or the main selling point is the most important thing. And, and oftentimes when you're shifting it, it takes, that's the most difficult thing to figure out is how to, how to sell the candidate or sell what you're trying to sell, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, that where that's where it comes down to in fundraising, and I think that's where some people uh, hit that wall. Luckily, at the level and what you're doing, you have a mission that's very good, and you know, most people would say pure, um, depending on how you look at it. So it, it, it's really great to to see you all engaged, um, and, I, and I won't go through too much of this, but really, I'd say the, the grassroots stuff is where you're at. Right, it's it's grassroots fundraising. It's connecting with groups. It's building a network with where you which with you have a commonality um, that others may not have access to. And for you all, the commonality is your, your peers and potentially their, their families or their parents or other orgs that they're engaged in. And whether or not you know it, folks that you don't talk to or communicate with have a commonality with you that they go to. They have kids at the school that you go to, or kids that do something with you in some sort of organization. And that connection is, you know, I'd say if I was giving career advice, I'd say networking and connections are the most important thing you can do. So um, I, I'll give one or two examples and then take questions of, of what I think were successful for other organizations that I've seen, high school, young Democrats in Orange County or otherwise. And I would say it's cultivation. It's not always having to ask and looking for something up front, but it's also providing, providing a resource of some sort. Um, and for you all, the, the biggest hint I could give is engage everyone locally, engage the electeds, engage the people that are already in positions of power so that you can leverage that for yourself or to make sure that you're you know, empowering the next generation realistically. And oftentimes that is by being the, the conduit or the place for internships for elected officials and by making that connection and being that um, I guess conduit again, you're able to get them to buy into the importance of what you do. And then you hit that next step, which is engaging them and engaging, and making them see that, hey, if I put resources into this organization, then th there's dividends to the community. We're helping people get engaged. And again, a lot, this has been a successful model. I'd say that the largest fundraisers I've ever seen are uh, groups like your own, getting a number of elected officials together, their supporters, and, you know, putting that money towards a good cause. Um, with that, I think I went about 10 minutes, so uh, throw, I'll throw questions if anyone has one. Yeah, and just feel free to either message me in the chat if you don't want to, like, um, unmute, or you can just raise your hand. Right, I'd say a lot of my stuff's pretty tailored towards uh, California and Orange County, although we're a pretty large state, so there's a lot of different things going on. I'd say a lot of this is very local to the place that you are. So happy to answer any questions or any specific examples anyone may have of, hey, Luke, do you have a question? Hi there. So what would be uh, your suggested strategy uh, for fundraising in areas that are uh, very solidly Republican, but still have a lot of money. Uh, the area I uh, my chapter is based out of is very affluent. However, it leans conservative by about 12 points. So what's your uh, strategy for that? Yeah, of course. And I guess I, I come from Orange County. So I don't know if many of you are familiar. We 
you know, our entire county board of, is Republicans, or at least until recently, uh, we have one seat now. None of our countywide offices are Democrats. Um, we just flipped a number of congressional seats that flipped back. So uh, I'm pretty familiar with the red area. I'd say the, the party is a good way to go about it if you don't have any municipal folks. But again, the organizations, especially if you're in an affluent area, are still active. So uh, just the Planned Parenthoods of the world or the leaderships of different nonprofits, the folks that are engaged within your networks, there are still people that are contributing or supporting candidates outside of your area. And oftentimes there are linchpin individuals that are leading a major organization or maybe they're in the private sector. And you can see that they co people coalesce around them to bring resources to candidates when they do run, if they oppose one of these, I guess, plus 12 area, in one of these plus 12 areas, or they're supporting national candidates. And again, a lot of that stuff is public information. So you, you could find that information to see who it is and figure out what networks they're connected to, figure out how they are um, continuing to engage with those networks and, and raise, raise money for folks outside of where you are. Uh, Sammy? Yeah, um, hi, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, my question is like, what's your best advice to like kind of like try to get donors from, I guess, members who are like, or like, you know, people in the community who are less engaged with like our cause? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's always the, a difficult one. You know, I'd say bringing people in to a new cause, it, you know, I think you'll have a certain percentage of success with new people who aren't engaged in progressive or democratic causes. Unfortunately, the resources it takes to persuade someone as opposed to bring them in is much, it's much higher, right? When, when you're, when you're campaigning, you're just trying to get your information to Democrats and tell them you're a Democrat. When you're, if you're trying to persuade someone to vote for you, it, it takes 10, 10 times as many touches or, you know, it's not that six to eight, it's the 12, 15 touches to be able to get someone to change their mind. So when you're bringing folks in, I think there's enough low hanging fruit that you know, I think you can be successful, but if there's specific groups you're, you're trying to identify, I'd be happy to, happy to discuss them with you. Thank you. Nathan? Uh, yeah, so um, I overall like, liked your uh, introduction and presentation, but one thing you mentioned was like sort of building the importance of, um, you know, like building connections and, you know, building your network overall. Uh, the one thing our chapter like sort of struggled with was like, you know, branching out to like new people because like we have uh, such a tight circle like within our school and we're also like the only branch like in our county. So like, how do you propose like sort of building the connections given like, again, I guess uh, sort of going back to the last question, like those who aren't like super engaged, um, you know, like with in regards to like having like one chapter in such like a large area. Yeah, where whereabouts are you? Um, I'm near like Trenton, like Mercer County, like near there. Okay. You, uh, you know, I'd I'd say um, go, going after the statewide politics is, is never a bad option. There are a lot of caucuses and people that are, uh, I guess, branching out and considering getting folks like you engaged and using their resources and their networks. Um, Again, if, even if there aren't people that are engaged with you, there's probably people that are supporting. And I guess I don't know what the registration shift is, but if you look at the percentage of people that are giving money, whether it's low or, or high dollar, uh, th there are still folks. And I think being able to look under each of those rocks, but on the on the secondary level, in areas where it's difficult and you know, for, for a long time, it was difficult here to, to continue to build that. And some of our organizations still, still suffer from the, from the difficulties of the past in Orange County. And we've shifted and we've had a lot of successes, but what you're talking about, it never goes away. We're always trying to bring more people in and get more people engaged. Um, and it, it's a struggle. It, it, that's one of the most difficult things we do. But with, for folks like you, again, I'd say, if you're looking for the organization or fundraising, there are people who, who you, you've missed potentially, but if you're looking for yourself and for professional development, there's always additional organizations that are potentially apolitical that you can, that you can engage with and introduce you. 
yourself too. And the final piece of advice I give on that is just cast a really wide net because most people, you know, I'd say, and, and my email is just ashalvandi at gmail if anyone has any follow-up questions. Most people, you know, I'd say I'm, I'm a few years out from being way too busy to answer any emails. <laughs> and, but I will catch an email every now and then. And even if I'm probably way too busy now, you know, these things are important to people and they will respond eventually. Um, and that's part of the reason why just getting as much of your information out as possible is important. I have one question from the chat, which unfortunately I think has to be our final question just because of like time constraints. Um, but this person asked what advice you would give to young people who like are thinking about a career in like the political space. Yeah, you know, I think some of some of the stuff I said was was meant to be a little bit of that, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I guess political space is different than fundraising. Uh, generally, fundraising is probably one of the most difficult ones, just because it, it takes a little bit of juggling of a, a lot of different aspects of, of your of your life. Um, but to get into politics, again, it, it's the networks. It, it's to just start at the ground level, build yourself up. As I mentioned, I interned, I worked at, for a firm, uh, just figuring out a way to get your foot in the door and then uh, eventually moving up and up and up. Um, but additionally, you know, I, I once taught a class on careers after graduating from college and I always told people, get your bachelor's, but consider a master's, consider going to higher education because that really is a, um, a something that sets you apart from your peers uh, because there, you know, a lot of folks aren't, even, even in the political spectrum, may not even have their bachelor's or, or their master's. And when you're trying to break into something that's hard to break into, that can be very helpful. All right. Well, with that, you know, thanks so much for having me. It's it's great to good to see all your your faces or or not see those of you who are off camera, um, or those of you who popped on briefly to say hello. But uh, thanks again, and I'm wishing you all the best of, on your efforts. Yeah. No. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Like we appreciate it so much, and I personally like loved your talk. Um, and just you know, I just want to say thank you again. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks so much. You all have a good one. Oh, and, and happy new year. Persian New Year's today. I'll be remiss if I didn't mention it. Bye. Um, okay, I think with that, well, I mean, that was really good. I don't know about you guys, but I thought that was really, he was a really good speaker. Um, but I think with that, we can probably move on to like the actual training content section of this training. Sorry, that was like an overuse of the word training, but... Um, so the first section, I guess, of this presentation is just more so about how to stay organized, you know, how to actually engage with the planning part of fundraising. So first, first step, um, just sending in emails, because obviously when you're organizing not only a fundraising initiative, but just any political event or panel or workshop in general, you probably need to send emails. So the first step, just make sure that you get the contact information of the person that you want to email. Um, oftentimes you're gonna be emailing someone who you don't know personally. So you might have to look a little bit online and do some digging, but it's usually accessible on a website of their place of work. Um, and then just make sure to consider the objective of your email. You know, what exact message do you want to get across? Do you want to invite this person to speak at, a bit, at an event that your chapter is hosting? Or do you want this restaurant to um, sponsor merchandise that your chapter is creating? Whatever it is, just make sure that you have a clear idea of the email that you're going to be sending. And, you know, obviously just make sure that you have a succinct email line, you know, not too long because otherwise um, that could cause your email to either be ignored or sent to spam. So just make sure that it's very succinct and clean. Um, and just make sure that like, especially if you don't know this person, like your email is formal, you know, using language like good morning or good afternoon, whatever time of day it is and best regards and, you know, make sure to thank them. Um, that's always appreciated and, you know, always makes you more likely to actually get a response um, and just, you know, make sure that your message, like your email line is very polite and concise. 
And then finally, just make sure to check your grammar because I don't know, at least personally, I'm always more likely to respond to someone if their grammar is like correct versus if like they're misspelling things every other word. So just make sure to keep that in mind, kind of like you would for an essay in school. Um, and I'll pass it off to Semi for the next slide. Thank you, Shreya. Um, so yeah, the next thing is how to like plan a schedule, you know? Um, so I think the key thing with your schedules is just keeping organized. Um, it's all, I always recommend just like, just initially just writing your to-dos down, just on like typing it down or writing it on a planner or paper, um, as well as ranking them by priority. Um, you know, if you're on a time constraint or something, you at least know like, what your top priorities are and what you're aiming to achieve um and speaking of time management a little bit you know it's always good to write how long each task is going to take so if i have to have a meeting with shreya um i'll have to plan a training you know like that might take an hour and it's really good to write that down take a mental note beforehand just so you can allocate your time wisely and it's also important to think kind of holistically and just create your schedule based on what other activities you have going on, whether it be other clubs or you have like you're busy with school. And I just recommend like staying flexible because you never really know what can happen with your schedule if some event might move or someone might cancel. Um, but yeah, and then some other tips we also have for you guys is just avoid task switching as much as possible, as well as maybe batch tasks every now and then. Um, and then, you know, mental health is a priority. So make sure you set some of your own time just to chill and take a breather. And then I think we're gonna pass it on to Annika. Hey everyone, sorry, I am having some technical difficulties right now. So I'm gonna give it back to Shreya and I will hopefully be back in a second. Sounds good. Okay, so the next kind of how-to we have is how to create a budget, which, you know, as you would expect, is very, very important to organizing a fundraising initiative. So first of all, just make a list of all the expenses that you think your event will have. So for example, if you're like creating merchandise that you plan to sell to your chapter members and friends and family, you know, how much would it take to ship this merchandise? How much would it take to buy the t-shirts? Stuff like that. Just make sure that you're accounting for all possible expenses and just like note them down. And then secondly, you know, make sure that you determine, you know, potential sources of revenue. So I guess just going back to the merchandise example, um, you know, for example, who would be a good target that would actually buy this merch and uh, use these t-shirts? So, you know, obviously your chapter membership. And then if you want to go big and expand beyond that, then maybe start targeting your friends and family. And if you're feeling ambitious, maybe ask your school administration or principal if you'd be allowed to sell this merchandise in your school, especially if you run um, a school affiliated chapter. Um, and then of course, you know, make sure that you're monitoring your progress and making adjustments as necessary. Um, and we have a lot of terms listed below that you might not know. Um, and honestly, like I honestly, I really don't know them either. Like I was doing my research and I found them very commonly used. So I just list them here. Um, but just make sure that you're monitoring your progress, you know, making adjustments and changes to your plans as needed. Like, for example, if you find that not a lot of your friends and family are buying as much merch as they should, you know, maybe make some sort of social media initiative or GoFundMe initiative that would allow you to uh, target that audience more successfully. Yeah, um, and now we're talking about a little bit about like just like general tips to stay organized. Um, I think that I should be taking these tips a little more. Um, I'm not that organized, but that's all right. So just like for starters, um, writing your to do's down, you know, just making sure you kind of it's I always think it's helpful if I just write in my agenda, just like everything I need to accomplish for the day um as well as just like com commitments that you have or just any general notes um and like i said i use my school agenda for some of the stuff that i have for work and hsda and like other school commitments 
But I, if you don't have a school agenda, I just recommend investing in a planner. Um, they're really cheap for the most part. And you could just use like, if you don't want to get a planner, you can also have like no cards, flashcards. Um, if you have a whiteboard in your room or anything like that, uh, you can color code with different crayons, markers or anything. That, that All of those help. They might sound like stupid, but it really helps a lot. Um, um, <laughs> And uh, as well as, um, you know, just create deadlines. If you like set tangible deadlines that are possible um, and realistic, and if you hold yourself accountable to completing your tasks by those, those deadlines, I guarantee that your productivity is gonna go up by a lot. Um, and another thing, try not to procrastinate. Um, it's, I recommend taking a break after you complete a certain task. and for like how long of the break, I would make it kind of proportional to the task and the work that needed to be done. Um, as well as the next thing is if you have other responsibilities and you're working in a group, delegating responsibilities always helps, you know, like you don't need to do all of the work and take all the burden on your own. I just think it's best to, you know, work with everyone as a team. Um, and when we're talking about like tasks and all, just make sure you're only writing down and noting down relevant tasks, necessary tasks, and you don't want to bother yourself with, I guess, more nitpicky type of stuff. And like the main goal is to just stay on task, stay focused and complete your goal. And the last thing is just focus on one thing at a time. Um, I'd like to think I'm a good multitasker, but I'm not. And most people aren't, uh, unless you are, that's great. But if you fall in, you know, the group with the rest of us, um, I recommend focusing just on one thing at a time um, and just try to stay hyper fixated on that. Okay, yeah, so now we're just going to delve a little bit into potential fundraising initiatives that your chapter could hold. Obviously, some of the ideas that we have listed in this presentation aren't like the only things that you could do, but they might be a good starting point and just might give you a good idea to jump off of. So the first idea slash initiative that we want to present to you are is t-shirt fundraisers, which I think I talked about a little bit before. Um, but essentially just in order to undertake a fund fundraiser like this, first, just make sure to partner with a retail company like Bonfire or Custom Inc. to actually sell this merchandise to members. Um, and this would actually be immensely helpful because this partner organization would handle all of the production and distribution of this merchandise. And you and your chapter members would really only have to worry about actually preparing the logo and design of this product. So it actually cut your workload in half and would be beneficial to both parties. Um, so just some notes about this type of fundraiser. It doesn't cost any money, which is a pro. Um, and it usually takes about two to three weeks to actually organize the entire thing. Um, your revenue kind of depends on how many t-shirts that you're able to sell and, you know, try to make them at a, a relatively affordable price because, you know, even though you're trying to make um, merchandise and, you know, make revenue, people probably won't buy your products if they aren't affordable. So just take that into consideration. Um, and then just this is kind of optional, but one idea is to hold some sort of comp graphic design competition inside of your chapter where your chapter members can submit ideas for um, the logo design. And, um, you know, members can even vote for this potential design and whichever design receives, receives the most number of votes um, can be the logo that your chapter uses for this merchandise. Um, and you can even do something like where members can vote and in order to vote, they have to pay like a quarter or something like that. That could also be another potential source of revenue. Um, but overall, it's just um, relatively easy to carry out, especially in comparison to some of the other fundraising initiatives. And, you know, it should be, it shouldn't cost much, it shouldn't cost anything, so. And the next thing is fundraising letters. Um, you guys probably, you guys all know your communities quite well, I assume. Um, so I recommend just creating a list of local businesses, corporations, foundations. Um, and obviously as we are in HSTA, like we encourage you to reach out to those who, who do have an affinity to democratic politics as well as educational outreach. Um, but additionally, like even if 
you aren't too familiar with groups that follow that criteria, I recommend noting down groups that maybe you've heard like from peers or members of the community, like that some of these businesses do like to donate to high school groups like that. It makes your job a lot easier if you have some goal in mind and that you have some intent behind the conversation. Um, and yeah, you can create a sample email or letter and you can, I know we sent an email template out or, um, earlier um, and like you can just like, can you send that to all of them, obviously edit it um, so that it fits your purpose and your cause. Um, that email was meant for our national, used by our national finance committee, um, reaching out to donors in local um, counties. Um, but so I definitely won't recommend copying and pasting and sending that to people in your community, but so definitely edit it, personalize it, make it your own. Um, and then, like I said, like write directly to these local businesses or, or foundations um, and ask your ask them for donations to support your advocacy efforts. Um, and yeah, like some notes we have, like it could just cost five dollars per letterhead and maybe it would take around two ish weeks um, to complete. Um, and like I said, you can email, um, but I would recommend, you know, sending a handwritten letter it does add a personal touch and it shows these people who you are um, trying to re reach out to. It shows that you care and that you did take the time out to write um, your, you know, your letter to them. Yeah, so I guess the next kind of idea we have is crowdfunding, which is actually a very common um, avenue for fundraising. So the first step, just, you know, make sure to set up a crowdfunding campaign via GoFundMe or ActBlue. Um, and, you know, the second step, just reach out to your friends and families for donation. And uh, just in terms of how you can actually carry this crowdfunding initiative out, you could potentially uh, base your donations on some sort of campaign or initiative that your, that your chapter organizes. Um, for example, if you have like a certain petition, um, let's say a petition asking your school district to uh, be more culturally inclusive in your school calendar. That's actually what my school district is doing right now. So that just came to my mind. But let's say you have like a petition like that. Uh, you could ask your donors to pledge like five dollars for every twenty signatures on um, for every twenty signatures on the petition. And this way, you know, it would ensure that your donors are actually seeing tangible results produced before they donate, and would likely make them more willing to actually, um, you know, give you give your chapter their money. Uh, the second option, which I think is actually very common in elementary school fundraisers, or at least it was where I grew up, uh, but just create an option for donors to mention a chapter member's name when they make the donation. Like, I don't know, like if your parents gave like $20 to your chapter in your name um, and just whoever, whoever the member with the most number of donations or who's cited the most number of times can receive a prize potentially like a gift card or a social media shout out or something like that. Um, and so overall, this should cost no money unless you go with the option that I just talked about, then it might take some money to um, actually purchase the gift card. Uh, but if you go with the first option, it really shouldn't take any money to organize at all. Um, and it should take anywhere between three, day, three days to three weeks to organize. Um, you know, it's really up to you how long you want to keep the crowdfunding initiative going for. Uh, but generally it's most effective if it's within like a short or within like a certain restricted time span, because that way people are actually like, they know they have a deadline to donate and they're more inclined to do so. Yeah, um, and I guess the next suggestion is hosting virtual events. Um, let's see, one thing that we have listed is you could have a virtual talent show. Um, and I know some chapters might be more like connected than others, but I do recommend like if you do have a really close knit chapter, you could organize a virtual talent talent show. Um, you could just ask your chapter members um, to like submit videos of themselves, like singing, dancing, playing an instrument, or 
doing some crazy trick um, and you could submit them on a Google form or something. And then like members of the community or just members of the chapter or school um, could vote for um, which contestants they win, who they'd like to win um, just by donating a dollar or so. Um, and yeah, and like I we also wrote at the end, you know, if you want, you could organize a platform where like audience members could place bets on who they think um, the winner would be. Um, and if any one of you guys do end up doing this virtual talent show idea, please tag HSMs. I really want to see how this goes. So I'm really hoping someone here does that. Um, and another thing, um, just organizing a virtual class or workshop. Um, you could, I know my chapter has done this in the past. Um, we've just invited a local representative um, who was very skilled in a certain topic like advocacy. Um, and they hosted a master class. And we asked our members just to donate a, like a dollar if they wanted to attend the master class. But we, we said that, um, like at least in my case, we said that all donations were just suggestions. You didn't have to actually donate anything. Um, and some people ended up giving like $25 a piece. Um, and that was a real, that was like a success. Um, but like, right, you could ask some people to pay $5 or $20 or depending on your, how like you think your chapter members' financial situations are, I'm not gonna assume this is kind of a broad, um, suggestion but yeah um and i guess like the last note if you're able to and if your i guess person who you're inviting is willing to accept donations um you could spend a portion of those profits that you gained from the donations to you know just like thank the person you could get a card or you can make a donation to their campaign something like that Yeah, and so for this next slide, we just kind of listed a bunch of ideas that we had that like didn't really fall under any specific category. So they all went under miscellaneous, um, but that's okay. So the first um, idea we kind of wanted to talk to you guys about was just asking your teachers, which honestly is really effective um, because you could just talk to them at the beginning or at the end of class about you know, posting information about your chapter's fundraising event on their classroom homepage, like my school uses Google Classroom. Um, or you could even ask them to just talk about it to your class. Um, and, you know, it's oftentimes really effective, at least that I've found, just because teachers are genuinely interested in the things that you're doing outside of schools. And like nine times out of 10, they would be more than happy to let you talk about it, especially given the cause. Um, and yeah, just, it never hurts to ask and it might even get you some brownie points in class, who knows. Um, and so the second idea we wanted to talk to you about was, um, you know, just advertising about your fundraiser through your library. Um, you know, whether it's just putting up flyers at your local library's bulletin board, uh, at least in my community, the library is just a very prominent um, center for that a lot of people, you know, often go to to study or just to like check out books or something. So it's a really great way to get the word out about your event to people who otherwise wouldn't be connected to your chapter in any way. Um, and you can even ask your library to place like a jar on their front desk to collect donations, um, you know. This is might be a little ambitious, but you could even ask people to like donate 25 to 50 cents for every book that they check out or every book that they donate if your library has that option. Um, and then finally, uh, this is an idea that kind of came out in 2020, I think. So it might not apply as much today, uh, but just a coronavirus swear jar, you know, ask your chapter members to place a dollar in the jar every time they use the word coronavirus. Um, but yeah. So yeah, now we're going to talk a little bit about navigating ActBlue. So just um, like, I guess, a basic introduction on ActBlue. Um, ActBlue is um, the top donation platform for all democratic um, and or progressive organizations, um, including HSDA. Um, 
and Act Blue, the portal um, receives donations from donors across the country, um, and it sends all of the contributions directly to these groups. Um, so I guess why is it useful? Um, it's, it's like it's it's an, it's a necessity to be honest because um, there's a lot of campaign finance laws behind the scenes. So um, Act Blue just takes the donations, processes them, and reports all of these donate all the donations made to the FEC and the IRS um, on our behalf. Uh, so it makes um, the third parties. Uh, job much easier, the party who's receiving the money. Um, and a fun little fact, more than $6 billion has been raised through Act Blue. Yeah, so how do you use Act Blue? So it's actually a pretty easy process, which honestly, I don't think most people would expect, including myself from like, uh, a fundraising platform, but basically HSDA will provide ActBlue links to you if you organize any sort of fundraising initiative. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's actually the only legal way for state, for local, state, and national chapters to collect funds. So make sure that you use it. Um, and just to use these funds, you can send an HSDA ActBlue link to your donor who can then fill out the okay. information and submit. And it's that easy. Okay, um, so before we get into this next section, um, hi guys, my name is Senez. I'm HSDA's communications director, and I just wanted to let you guys know, since you, I see a lot of local chapter leaders here, um, in a few weeks, we're going to be launching the Race to Summit, which is a nationwide grassroots fundraising initiative meant to help us raise money for our national summit, which will be happening this summer. Um, in past years, it's been in person, but for the past few years, because of COVID, it's been virtual. And so we really, really want to make it possible for our membership to have an in-person summit, get together, get to meet people from across the country who are really interested in organizing in democratic politics, just like you. Um, and so in order for all of that to happen, we need... Um, We, I just muted whoever that was. Um, we need like our local chapters to help us out. And so the way that this is going to happen is we're going to be giving you guys the opportunity to kind of compete to see which local chapter from each of the regions and each of the states is able to gather the largest number of donations. Um, and hopefully we'll see you guys all participate. I'll be sending out an email very soon with a little bit more information about Race to Summit but just wanted to give you guys a heads up. You, you're the first people to be hearing about this beyond just the national team. So I hope that you will participate. Yeah, thank you for that, Thomas. Um, So the, the next topic that we have is boosting local chapter engagement. So yeah. So, I'm myself as um, I'm a local chapter leader. Um, and what my chapter does to maintain engagement is that we try to have as much fun programming as possible for our members, whether it just be like small little events or we try to bring in a local speaker or just a teacher in our school. We just try to spice things up as much as possible. Um, so we have a few programming ideas listed for you guys. So you could have ID, you can try to give resources for your members so that they can work on a local political campaign, um, as well as legislative advocacy. You can call your local reps or just any democratic reps or progressive reps um, in your state to so that you could lobby or testify at your state's capital, whether it be for yourself or on behalf of your chapter. Um, yeah, and then as well as you could organize a panel with guest speakers, you know, Maybe you could invite some teachers, like history teachers or something, or like government teachers for your school, or you could invite like people on your board of aldermen, something like that, um, as well as organizing days of action. Um, I know that for some chapters, it might be hard just to figure out what the topic is for your day of action. Um, for that, I recommend just kind of like a little bit of self-reflection on why you're passionate for politics, um, what are your issues which like motivate you to democratic causes, um, or 
if you don't want to do that, you could just stay current with current events um, and potentially a, you could do a Ukraine day of action, something like that, or just like keeping up with the news could help you with some ideas for that. Um, and I know the next thing we have is voter registration drives. Um, I know that the rules for um, registering to vote are different for every state. I know in some states you can um, bring in the someone else's voter registration papers on their behalf. Um, I know that some states are far more restrictive, so that's a little harder to do. But in cases like that, where you are, like I know someone mentioned earlier that they're in like a plus 12 points red district, something like that, um, and you have to deal with all of these conservative policies, um, I recommend just having all of the information and resources out there and inform your members and inform people in your local area or your chapter how to get involved and how to register um, if you are unable to like be a little bit more hands-on with that process um, as well as like a rec just a recreational get together and meet up with your chapter i know um last year at summit we had a local chapter day um and that was over the summer and my chapter we just got together we had remote learning all year um and it was just a great way for us to get back and just talk about a little bit of politics and what's going on in our local community um and then the last thing is collaborating with other local chapters you could have a virtual event with them if you have no chapters near local chapters nearby or you could have an in-person event my chapter um, ahead of our, right before our municipal elections, we had a whole phone banking session for two hours with a chapter at the school next door. And it was definitely a blast. So I definitely recommend that for all chapters if you are able to have an in-person event with a nearby local chapter. Yeah, and then just in terms of how you can get more people involved, whether it be actual chapter members or just in terms of like, forging partnerships. So, you know, just make sure that you at least try and get in contact with your local Democratic Party. Um, I remember that like when uh, I was like leading my chapter during like a couple of years ago, this was actually pre-COVID, so it was a long time ago, um, but we got in touch with our local Democratic Party and it was actually really useful because they put us in contact with uh, other community chapters in our area and we got to you know just kind of collaborate together and we got to meet other similarly passionate members and it was just a really nice get together um, and you know we wouldn't have been able to do that without um, our local democratic party support um, and you know just in terms of fundraising ask them to repost your fundraising flyer whether it be on social media or just you know hanging up in their office they might even have some connections to like local restaurants or uh, merchandising platforms that will help you get your fundraiser going. Um, and it's just really important to try and get into contact with these people because oftentimes they're very excited about helping out um, kind of the next generation of political leaders and they just really want to meet you and be involved with um, youth. So youth, because they don't normally get the chance to do that. So just check, make sure you do that. Um, and then also, of course, try and work with similar democratic organizations. Like if there's a young Democrats chapter in your area, make sure to reach out to them. I think also there's a teen Democrats organization. If there's a chapter in your area, collaborate with them. Uh, just because you guys are obvious, both organizations are working towards very similar goals. So oftentimes both parties would have been happy to collaborate with one another um, because that, not, that just expands the reach and the impact of this program. Um, and then finally, just make sure to utilize social media. HSDA actually has a whole um, guide on boosting digital engagement, which I've linked like in the presentation. And I believe that's actually going to be sent out in an email later. So make sure to keep your eye out for that. But just in terms of like general tips, uh, just make sure that you're posting regularly, that you have like a person who actually is like in charge of making social media content, uh, just because like, as I'm sure many of us can relate many or Gen Z is very active on TikTok and Instagram. And it's really important that your chapter is utilizing all of these forms of social media just to try and get in contact with as many teenagers who are potentially interested in this cause as possible. And yeah, I think with that, that pretty much concludes this training. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming again. And, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to speak now.
Sorry, I, I was just reading your message. I was busy typing up our contact info in the chat and then I got distracted. Um, Same and Treya, could you just like let them know your emails in the chat in case anyone has any additional questions? And then I will answer this one. Um, so hi, Jackie. Um, as we're leading up to summit, it is obviously very important that states be able to engage with their local leaders, just to make sure that you guys are like the local leaders are available to be hosting like fundraising and such. Um, and so the way that we would recommend doing this is by if you have a list like a state master list of the chapters that are very engaged, if you don't have one, you can email Sanvi or me and we'll get you a list of those chapters. Um, try to set up like one on one calls or reach out to them personally, like the chapter leaders from each of the very active chapters and just send them the guides for fundraising and such. Um, for Race to Summit, National is going to be putting out certain resources that like will help you with this. Um, for example, if you've seen like dare boards on social media, like I'll crack an egg on my head if you donate $5 to my organization, that type of thing, except better, except better. Um, we'll be giving you fun things like that that local chapters can definitely use just to like get engaged. Um, and hopefully we might even, this is like a might, a big might. Um, we might be putting out things like popcorn fundraisers, which are similar to things that a lot of school clubs or like orchestras and bands do just to raise money by selling like some other thing that is very nonpartisan, like popcorn. Um, we'll give you those resources, but since Summit is coming up and since the Race to Summit will be starting very soon, the biggest thing that you as a state leader can do is really try to revitalize or re-engage the local chapters that may be floundering right now and just reaffirm to the ones that are very active that you appreciate them and you really want them to help us out moving forward. So setting up those one on one calls, I think is definitely step one, and it'll help out. Do we have any other questions? And if you don't feel like asking a question right now, that's totally fine. You can always email any of us. We're pretty responsive. Um, okay, yeah. I mean, I guess if no one else has any questions, feel free to hop off. I mean, again, thank you guys so much for coming. We appreciate it like so, so much. Like, you have no idea. And, you know, we're so excited to see what you guys are going to do for this Race to the Summit campaign. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. He accidentally private messaged me and so I was like, bye, but you did not know that. Hi, Trent. Turn off the recording.